Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Luke, reading from the 8th chapter, verses 26 through 39. So let's attend to God's word for us this morning. Jesus and the disciples sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in the house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town, how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. <coughs> you pray for us. Lord our God, use my words, use all our ears and our hearts and our minds to hear what you would speak to us. For you are our rock and our salvation. Amen. So I remember some years back when our children were young, when our oldest children were in elementary school. And one day our daughter Katie came home from kindergarten. And she said, someone got in trouble today because they used the S word. And we said, oh, really? And so... What happened? I said, yeah, Susie said the, the S word to Michael. She told him to shut up. <laughs> <clears throat> Isn't it funny how, how some words become unmentionable in different situations, in different places? One of those words for, for the mainline modern church is the E word, evangelism. Evangelism is one of those words that makes us uncomfortable. Because when we think about evangelism, we, we think about you know, trying to force your beliefs on somebody else. Or we think about that, that wild-haired guy standing on the street corner with a sandwich board that says, the end is near. Or maybe we think about that, that well-dressed young man and woman who knock on the door at inopportune times to ask, if you died tonight, do you know where you'd be tomorrow? Evangelism sometimes makes us uncomfortable. But evangelism was one of those passions for the early church. The church that we read about in Acts 2. <clears throat> Today is, is the last Sunday in our sermon series on those commitments of the early church. It's the last time we get to hear that passage from Acts 2 read uh, on Sunday morning for a while. We've, we've talked about how that early church was committed to, to genuine relationship and to wholehearted worship, to real spiritual growth and, and to uh, that idea of generous living. 
And today we read that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And the thing is, that didn't just happen. People didn't just show up. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved because people were hearing about what was going on. They were hearing about what was happening in that early church. They were hearing about what Jesus had done. They were being evangelized. Now, that word evangelize, it comes from a Greek word that means to share good news. And back at the time that the New Testament was written, it didn't mean to share religious news. It just meant to share good news. But not just any good news. It meant really good news, life-changing news. When the Emperor Augustine became the Emperor of Rome, he sent messengers, he sent evangelists out to announce that. We have a new emperor. The kind of good news that, that evangelism refers to isn't, you know, hey, I got an A on my exam. Yes, that's good news. But life-changing news, like, I'm engaged to be married. Or we're going to have a child. That's the kind of good news it refers to. And one of those peculiarities with translating the Bible into different languages, that same Greek word, which sounds the same as a verb and as a noun in Greek, we talk about it as evangelize, as a verb. But in, in English, the noun is gospel. Gospel that means good news. So to evangelize is to share the gospel, to share good news. And again, not just any good news, but life-changing news. The kind of good news that this demon-possessed man had to share. This man we read about in Luke's gospel this morning. This man had been possessed by a demon. He'd been a prisoner of the demons within him. And because of that, he was a prisoner of society as well. They chained him. And then when he, was, when he would escape, he was driven away from society. He was a prisoner, but Jesus set him free. To his own amazement, the amazement of those around him, Jesus changed his life. This was great news. And what did Jesus ask him to do in response to what had been done? All Jesus said was, go back home. Tell people how much God has done for you. And we read in verse 39, that's what the man did. He went back and he told everyone how much Jesus had done for him. That's evangelism. One of the things I'd like us to, to think about is that Jesus says the same thing to us that we are to tell everybody how much God has done for us. We are to be evangelists. And you may be wondering why. Why should I evangelize? Why should I be out there sharing the news? I want to give you a few possibilities to think about. The first one is, is pretty obvious, somewhat blatant one. And that is that if you believe in the traditional Christian teaching that those who belong to Jesus are saved and those who do not belong to Jesus are damned, that's pretty good reason for sharing the good news. If you have people you care about, presumably you don't want them damned. And so you share the good news. Now, I understand that, that that idea that those who belong to Jesus are saved and those who are not are damned, that that is uh, something that, that many people struggle with. And in fact, there are pastors that struggle with that as well. Methodist Bishop Will Willimon tells this story. He says, he says, early in my ministry I served a little church in rural Georgia. One Saturday we went to a funeral in a little country church not of my denomination. He says, I grew up in a big downtown church. I had never been to a funeral like this one. 
There was an open casket, and the funeral consisted of a sermon by their preacher. He says, the preacher pounded on the pulpit and looked over at the casket. He said, it's too late for Joe. He might have wanted to get his life together. He might have wanted to spend more time with his family. He might have wanted to do that, but he's dead now. It's too late for him, but it is not too late for you. There is still time for you. You still can decide. You are still alive. It is not too late for you. Today is the day of decision. <laughs> Willem goes on to say that the preacher then told how a Greyhound bus had run into a funeral procession on the way to the cemetery, and that that could happen today. He said, you should decide today. Today is the day to get your life together. Too late for old Joe, but it's not too late for you. Well, as they were driving back from the funeral, Willowman talks about how angry he was. And on the way home, he told his wife, he says, have you ever seen anything as manipulative and insensitive to that poor family? I found it disgusting. <coughs> and his wife responded, I've never heard anything like that. It was manipulative. It was disgusting. It was insensitive. But worst of all, it was also true. If you believe in the traditional Christian teaching about heaven and hell, that is strong motivation for evangelism. But it's not the only motivation for evangelism. I can't tell you how many times I've had people say to me in the midst of a hard situation, whether it's a death in the family or an illness that they or someone else has gone through, I can't tell you how often people say to me, I can't imagine how someone gets through this without faith. Well, if that's true, don't we want to share our faith so that we don't have people we know who have to go through situations like that without it? Isn't that a good reason to share the good news today? But I also want you to think about this. Here you are on a Sunday morning instead of, well, you probably wouldn't be on a golf course today because it's a little chilly, but some of you are. You might be sleeping in your warm bed, but you're here. Your faith is important to you. And the question is, why? What about following Jesus is important to you that you're here on Sunday morning? Why does your faith matter? How does it affect your life, the way you look at the world? Because if your faith is important to you, shouldn't you share that with others? If it's important, then isn't it kind of selfish to keep it to yourself? There are a lot of reasons for sharing our faith, for evangelizing. But then the question is, well, how? How do we do that? And the first thing I'd like us to, to think about there is that you should share what you know, not what you don't know. The truth is that if you're talking to a, a friend or a family member or an acquaintance, and telling them abstract, abstract truths about the faith, explaining the Apostles' Creed to them, they're really not going to care. They want to know how it makes a difference for you. Why is your faith important to you? You know your story, so share that. Share what you know. <clears throat> Don't use evangelism, no use sharing your faith as a, as a context <clears throat> for an argument. I read a great uh, quote on Facebook the other day. I don't know who it was from. Facebook tends to, to do that sometimes. But a great statement in there that said, the gospel is an announcement, not an argument. You share it, not shove it. The gospel is an announcement, not an argument. You share it, not shove it. There are people who are going to want to argue about religion, and that's fine. Okay. 
They can do that, but you don't have to participate in that. <laughs> Jesus said to his disciples, don't cast your pearls before swine. It's a bad day for pigs, sorry about that. <laughs> Those are involved in, in that <laughs> industry. <laughs> Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Because they'll just trample them underfoot and then turn and then your faith, your personal faith, that is, that's precious. That is pearls. And you're not expected to just throw that out so that people can trample on it. You don't need to cast your pearls before swan. You share with those who want to know. Now, that doesn't mean you don't answer anybody's questions. If people have genuine questions about the faith, then you share what you know. And you're not afraid to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. And maybe you can point them to a book, or maybe you can point them to somebody else who might be able to answer their question for them. But share what you know, not what you don't know. And finally, in sharing your faith, it has to be something that you live. There's a reason why we've waited until the last week of this series to talk about evangelism. Because if you don't know about real community, if you don't know about wholehearted worship and real spiritual growth and generous living, then your sharing of your faith isn't going to have much behind it. It has to be evident in your life. That's part of the reason for doing the, the strips of kindness today. It's just a way of showing who you are. That your faith makes a difference to you. It's why Peter, in our epistle reading today, says to do everything with a, a clear conscience. Living your faith so that people don't hear what you have to say and say, why should I listen to them? They don't live. We need to live what we believe so that we can share And last of all, but in many ways, first of all, we need to be praying as we're sharing. Pray about who God wants you to talk to. Pray about that ability to just share your story. Not to argue anybody into the faith, but to share why it's important to you. Undergird all of it with prayer. And if you do pray about when and where, and how to share your faith, God will give you opportunities. They will happen. Be careful what you ask. But if we do that, if we, as God's church, make evangelism a passion, if we are willing to, to risk and to share, to offer our pearls, not, not before those who don't want them, but the those to those who ask the reason for the hope that is in us. Then God will do here as he did there. And he will add to our number daily those who are being saved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.